Jenny Brown was a James Mishner Fellow in Poetry at UT, now teaches creative writing at Trinity University. She has received grants in both poetry and creative nonfiction from the Texas Writers League and the San Antonio Artists Foundation. She is the author of two books of poems, At Once and The Second Reason. New poems and essays have recently been published or are forthcoming in American Poetry Review, Gulf Coast, the New York Times, and Tin House. And she lives in the Lavaca neighborhood with her husband, Scott Martin, and their daughters, Lyda and Harriet. You should be here, I believe. Is that right? Please welcome <laughs> poet Jenny Brown. with words. So this whole notion of um, commenting on images was a little um, new to me. And, and I, when I decided what to do tonight, I was thinking about images we have of one another. And I was recently asked to contribute to a symposium on race and contemporary poetry, and in which I was asked to answer several questions about writing about race as a white poet, and what fears, mistakes, experiences, um, history I brought to that conversation. So what I'm going to do is read um, a series of poetic fragments that I wrote for that project. And now I'm going to push the button. <laughs> on the morning of April 29, 1992, I stood on a cliff overlooking Freetown, the capital city of Sierra Leone, West Africa and watch soldiers overthrow the government in a military coup. Hanging off the sides of their truck, they shot their guns at the sky. Once the soldiers reached the presidential palace, they opened the front gates and let dozens of street children have at the biggest mango tree in the yard. I can still see them looting mangoes, carrying more than their little arms could hold, dropping a few and laughing. As a 20-year-old undergraduate studying at Fora Bay College, I'd lived in Sierra Leone for a year, using the word black to describe the other students at the college, or those soldiers who filled the streets, or those laughing children, or most anyone I saw, spoke to, touched, smelled, loved, feared, pitied, wanted, hated, imagined, hurt, or forgot, had for the first time in my life become irrelevant. Later that night, I turned the dial on my shortwave radio, trying to find news of the events happening outside my window. Instead, I heard reports that a mob was forming at the corner of Florence and Normandy, that gangs of men were pulling motorists from their cars and attacking them, that a jury had just acquitted the four LAPD officers who'd been videotaped beating Rodney King, that Los Angeles was burning. The American Embassy evacuated all non-essential Americans from Sierra Leone the next morning. Back in my hometown in southern Indiana, there was also trouble. My parents had sent me a letter in Africa reporting that my little sister was dating a black guy. That was all he was described as being. That summer, working at a garage sale, I sat next to an elderly woman at the checkout where we made change for dimes. We got to talking about Alabama, where she was from. After we'd both been quiet for a while, she suddenly said, I think I'd still rather live in the real South and have someone call me nigger to my face than sit right here next to you and think everything is all right but never really know for sure. A few years after I returned from Africa, I tried to write an essay about the confluence of the Sierra Leonean coup, the LA riots, and the upheaval my sister's new relationship brought to my immediate family. I showed a draft of the essay to a Cuban friend. She tried to be constructive, but I could tell she was pissed. The thing I'm having the most trouble with, she said calmly, is that this essay assumes a multiracial relationship would only be difficult for your family. What about the boy's family? I hadn't even thought of that. One definition of white privilege is not having to think about it, or at least thinking you don't have to. 
Once when I was a TA for an intro poetry class at the University of Texas, the professor, a black man, asked a white student why he hadn't turned in his assignment. That's all he said, why didn't you turn in your poem? The boy held up his hands in front of his face and said, please don't hit me, man. The professor, let's go on and cue the distinctions here, Whiting, Guggenheim, etc., and the three acclaimed books, and the dedication to teaching, and the kindness I witnessed on a daily basis was a lot of other things. But in that moment, he was instantly reduced to one, big, violent, scary black man. Don't tell him not to think about it. I live in San Antonio, Texas now. The majority of people in my town, both the most and least powerful, are Mexican-American. The mayor's Mexican-American, and so is the woman who sits outside the stop and go on the corner. So is my elderly neighbor. My husband and I took her with us to vote for Obama. On the way there, she admitted she wasn't a citizen and that she really just wanted to get out of the house. <laughs> She's lived on the street for 20 years. My husband's last name is Martin. There are a lot more Martinez's than Martin's in the phone book. Once at a local poetry reading, the host introduced me by saying, well, her name is Brown, but we all know she's not really the right kind of brown. I guess we'll let her read anyway. Once when I was teaching a poetry workshop at a school in San Antonio, a Hispanic administrator said, you just have to know what you're dealing with. You have to reason with the white kids, yell at the black kids, and tell the Hispanic kids friend what you want, and then let them ask them. It's not so hard, you just have to know what you're dealing with. He said what, not who. If I write about race, I want to write about who, not what. I struggle to write about race because I feel committed to bringing a level of contradiction and complexity that includes everything I've just written here. I distrust poems that are too sure of anything, even hope, even hatred. The words we use to describe one another are never irrelevant. I worry about writing all these memories and sketches without commentary or much investigation. I worry equally about guilt and denial. When the first grandchild in my family was born half Mexican and the next half Korean, my grandfather waited for a third, then said, look, I finally got a good one. That's me, the good one. I've never published a poem about my time in Africa, but because I believe poems originate from psychic places we don't completely understand, places that may never be okay, every poem I write is in some way about Africa. I've never written a poem about the LA riots, but because my poems examine relationships to place, to language, to people, to rhythm, to emotion, and to history, and because relationships are inherently about power, every poem has a riot inside it. Who am I writing from? I remember peeking through an open window in Africa, watching two beautiful women braid extensions for their hair. I remember getting punched by a brown girl in junior high and punching back. I remember small African children touching my skin when I wasn't looking, then running for the bush in fear. I have red hair, and some people thought that meant I was a witch. I remember clutching my new white baby to my chest when I passed a group of young Mexican men slumped outside the stop and go. One of them saw me seeing him. He looked me in the eye. Don't be afraid, he said. <laughs> <laughs>